the founder of demonic cultivation, an English translation by Fan E E thirty three, read by Luna Minerva. Chapter six, Pride, Part two. Once the sky darkened further, it would be impossible to navigate the forest without a torch. Wei Wuxian continued for a while into the mountain, but surprisingly encountered barely anyone. Did so many clans really decide to stay in Fojia village, arguing and playing armchair general instead of hunting? And had other clans, like the people he had met earlier, really reached their wits' end and decided to return empty-handed? Suddenly, cries of help echoed somewhere ahead of him. Someone! Please! Rescue us! Some of the voices were men, some were women, but all had the panicked, helpless tone of people lost in the wild mountains. There was an 80 to 90 percent chance that this was the work of evil spirits, attempting to lead ignorant naives into their traps. But Wei Wuxian was very pleased. The eviler, the better. He was only afraid that they wouldn't be evil enough. He slapped the donkey and rode toward the sound's origin. He saw nothing in any of the four directions, but when he looked upward, he discovered that there were, in fact, no monsters, demons or ghosts, only the family of small-time cultivators he had met near the rice paddies, who were now hanging from the trees in brilliant golden nets. The middle-aged man had originally brought his offspring with him to scout the area, but they didn't encounter any of the prey they had expected. Instead, they had stepped in some rich person's net. They didn't know whose and were captured and dangled from the tree branches where they could only complain bitterly and wait for rescue. Sensing someone approaching, they were suddenly overjoyed, but when they saw the person was the lunatic, they immediately lost hope. The spirit-binding nets were made of very thin ropes, but high-quality material. Thus, they held fast and didn't break. Once they caught something, whether it was a god or a ghost or a demon, it had to struggle for a long time in order to break free. Only other, better spiritual tools could cut it out. The lunatic said he'd help them get down, but who knew if he even knew what he was dealing with? Just as they were about to shout at him to find help, the sound of agile feet dashing over branches and leaves approached them. Through the black mountain forest swept a youth wearing a light, pale robe. This young master had a vermilion mark between his eyebrows. His features were delicate and pretty, yet also harsh and unkind. And he was very young, around Lan Sijue's age. He was still half a child, but held the longbow in his hand and wore a quiver of arrows on his back, as well as a long sword, which shined with golden light and glittered with gemstones. The embroidery on his clothes was as exquisite as any, uniting into a white peony over his chest, the golden threads slim glimmers in the night. Wei Wuxian sighed and muttered, Rich people. The boy was surely some young master from the Lan Ling Jing sect. That sect alone used the white peony as its emblem, suggesting that their own beauty was comparable to the flowers. The white peony was also the king of flowers, and thus through it, the Lan Ling Jin sect also subtly advertised that it, too, was the king of cultivators. The vermilion mark on their foreheads represented enlightenment and ideals illuminating the world. The young master had originally knocked an arrow on his bow, itching to shoot, but upon seeing that the spirit-binding nets contained only people, he was sorely disappointed. He whipped around suddenly, irritation written across his face. Every single time, it's you, idiots. There are over 400 spirit-binding nets hanging around this mountain, and none of them have caught anything, but already you people have ruined nearly 20 of them. Wei Wuxian's thoughts continued to be rich people. A single spirit-binding net already cost more than a humble sum, but this boy had used 400 in a single go. The price was enough to ruin a slightly smaller clan. The boy was sure worthy of the name Jin. 
but this kind of abuse of spirit binding nets to capture prey hardly counted as night hunting, which meant their true purpose was to keep people away and give them no opportunity to take a share of the spoils. It seemed the cultivators who had withdrawn earlier had done so not because the prey was too tough, but because offending an old illustrious clan like Clan Jin was more trouble than it was worth. After journeying freely for a few days and eavesdropping on interesting conversations in Fo Jiao village, Wei Wuxian had heard more than a little of how the tides of fortune had turned in the world of cultivation these past few years. The Lanling Jin sect had emerged as a primary winner of the period of chaotic clan warfare preceding his death, and was now the leader of all the clans and sects of cultivation. Even their sect chief was now called Chief Cultivator. Prior to this, the Jin sect had already possessed haughty airs and an inclination towards ostentatious displays of beauty and magnificence. Because they had risen higher and higher these past few years, amassing even more wealth and power, their children had developed a tendency to run amok. Even if the brats humiliated weaker clans, those clans could only swallow their anger and hold their tongues. The small village cultivators stood even less of a chance, so though this youth's language was cutting and the cultivators' faces were flushed red, they dared not bite back. The middle-aged man calmly and respectfully said, Please, young master, help us out and free us. The youth, impatient that his prey was taking so long to appear, vented his anger on the country bumpkins. Clenching his fist, he said, Hmm... How about you just hang here? That way you won't randomly run around and get in my way. Once I'm done catching the soul-eating creature, I'll cut you down, if I still remember. If they were forced to hang here the whole night, and whatever was prowling around Daofan Mountain happened to find them, they had no hope of getting away. Their souls would be sucked dry. The round-faced girl who had given Wei Wuxian the apple became scared and started crying loudly. Wei Wuxian had originally sat cross-legged on the donkey's back, but when the donkey heard her sobs, its long ears shook, and it suddenly leapt up. After it had leapt up, it let out a long bray, and if only the bray didn't sound so ugly, it would have been no exaggeration to compare its relentless heroic charge to that of a legendary steed. Caught off guard, Wei Wuxian was thrown off the donkey's back and only narrowly avoided cracking his head and bleeding all over his own face. The donkey gazed forward, lowered its big head and rushed straight at the youth, as though it firmly believed its skull could send him flying. But the youth's arrow was still knocked and he had just begun to pull back the bowstring. Wei Wuxian didn't want to be forced to find a new mount so soon, so he repeatedly yanked on the donkey's reins with all his strength. As the youth caught a glimpse of Wei Wuxian's face, shock flew across his expression, which then immediately melted into disdain. His lip curled. Oh, it's you. His voice was one-fifth astonishment and four-fifths revulsion. Hearing it, Wei Wuxian could only blink. The youth then said, Ugh, what, once you were kicked out and back to your old home you went insane? Look at how ghastly you've made yourself look. I can't believe they had the guts to let you out and let other people see you. What ridiculous thing had he just heard? Was he really... Wei Wuxian slapped his thigh. Was Mo Xuan Yu's dad not some random small-time clan leader, but actually the renowned Jin Guangshan? Jin Guangshan had been the Lanling Jin sect's previous sect chief, but had long since died. It was a lengthy story. He had a highly celebrated and fearsome wife, who was widely known to dominate his personality. But despite his fear of her, he couldn't stay away from other women, and no matter how fearsome Lady Jin was, she couldn't keep an eye fixed on him 24 hours a day. Thus, on the surface, they were a fine and illustrious loving family, but behind the curtain, Jin Guangshan wandered the wilderness and the countryside, satiating his carnal lusts. As long as he could have a girl, he wouldn't let her slip by. Moreover, because he so carelessly trampled around the grass, picking flowers and sowing his wild oats, he had acquired a herd of illegitimate children everywhere and in all directions. 
He was also extremely fickle, loved novelty and hated habit. Once he became bored of a woman, he tossed all thought of her out the window and did not feel a tingling of responsibility anywhere inside his head. Even his death was unseemly. Confident that though he was old, he was vigorous and wanting to challenge himself, he decided to fool around with a whole flock of women simultaneously. But unfortunately, he lost his own challenge and died amidst the throes of passion. Of course, this story was far too embarrassing for Clan Jin to let it pass through their lips, and thus the Lanling Jin sect reported to the rest of the world that their old chief had worked himself too hard and died of exhaustion. Hence, a tacit understanding developed. All clans would act as though they didn't know. In short, this was the true reason for Jin Guangshan's renown. After Jiang Chang, Jin Guangshan had made the second biggest contribution to the siege of the burial mounds. Now Wei Wuxian occupied his illegitimate son's body, and it was hard to say who had ultimately come out ahead. Noticing that Wei Wuxian had zoned out, the youth spoke in a voice filled with hatred. Fuck off! Why haven't you fucked off yet? Just looking at you makes me sick, you gay piece of shit! In terms of lineage, Mo Xuan Yu was probably this youth's uncle or something similar, a generation above him, yet the boy still tried to humiliate him. Wei Wuxian thought he really had to return the humiliation, if not for himself, then at least for Mo Xuan Yu's body. He said, Your mom may have had you, but she sure didn't raise you. Immediately upon hearing these words, two rage-filled flames flashed within the youth's eyes. He pulled his long sword from the sheath on his back and said menacingly, You! What did you say? The blade shined with brilliant golden light. It was a rare, first-class weapon. Many clans could toil for an entire lifetime without touching a sword its equal. Scrutinizing it, Wei Wuxian found it looked unexpectedly familiar, though, on the other hand, he had seen more than his fair share of golden-tipped swords. Consequently, he didn't consider it further, and instead began turning the small cloth pouch in his hand. This was a spirit-locking pouch, which he had put together out of a few scrap materials he happened to pick up the past few days. The youth hacked at him, but he pulled out a small sheet of paper cut in the shape of a man, sidestepped the swing and slapped it onto his opponent's back. The youth's movements were very quick but Wei Wuxian had a great deal of practice with things like tripping opponents and slapping paper seals on their backs, so he was even faster. The center of the youth's back went numb, then his entire back grew heavy, and then he had no option but to fall face first onto the ground, his sword clattering down beside him. However hard he tried, he couldn't get back up. It felt as though he were being crushed by Mount Tai. A gluttonous, dark spirit lied atop him, pressing down on him until he was gasping for breath. The little ghost, though weak, was more than enough to handle this kind of brat. Wei Wuxian picked up the boy's sword, weighted in his hands and sliced through the spirit binding nets above his head. The members of the family looked quite pathetic as they dropped down. Without a word, they bolted. The round-faced young woman looked as though she wanted to thank him, but was yanked away by one of her seniors for fear that his young master Jin might come to bear a more bitter grudge against them if they spoke too much. The boy on the ground said angrily, You gay piece of shit! You failed at developing your spiritual power, so now you've taken the evil way instead? You better watch out! D do you know who's here today? Today I... Wei Wuxian clasped his hands over his completely insincere heart. Oh, I'm so scared. Though his old practices attracted widespread castigation and, over the long term, damaged the practitioner's body and mind, they had rapid results and weren't limited by innate skill or spiritual strength. Thus, many were extremely tempted. There was never a lack of people who secretly craved shortcuts. This youth assumed that after Mo Xuan Yu had been chased out of the Lanling Jin sect, he had decided to walk the crooked path. It was a reasonable, fair suspicion, and allowed Wei Wuxian to avoid a lot of needless trouble. Bracing himself against the ground, the boy tried and failed to crawl back up a few more times. His face now thoroughly red, he gritted his teeth and said, If you don't remove this curse, I'll...
tell my uncle. He'll kill you. Finding this odd, Wei Wuxian said, Why your uncle and not your dad? Who's your uncle? Suddenly he heard a voice behind him, grim, cold and bitter like a wintry forest. I'm his uncle. Do you have any last words? Upon hearing this sound, all of the blood in Wei Wuxian's body seemed to rush toward his head at once, then completely evacuated shortly thereafter. It was fortunate that his face was already as white as death, if it got any whiter, no one would notice. A young man sauntered towards him, clad in light, violet robes with hemmed-in sleeves, his hand pressed against the pommel of his sword. A silver bell dangled from his waist, but when he walked, Wei Wuxian couldn't hear any ringing. The young man's apricot eyes were topped with slim, sleek brows and gave the impression of sharp, penetrating beauty. His gaze was heavy. A faint aggression burned beneath the surface, and to meet his eyes was to be struck by two cold balls of lightning. He walked until he was ten paces from Wei Wuxian, then stood in silence, his expression like an arrow on a tight bowstring. A conceited arrogance emanated from his countenance as he waited. Frowning, he said, Jin Ling, how much time are you going to waste? Do you need me to go over there and invite you back? Look at your sorry state, why the hell haven't you gotten back up? Once the initial shock passed, Wei Wuxian's conscious awareness rapidly returned. He curled his fingers inside his sleeve and recalled the paper man. Jin Ling, sensing the burden on his back lightening, immediately rolled, grabbed his sword and scrambled up. In a flash he was by Jiang Chang's side, pointing angrily at Wei Wuxian. I'm going to break your legs! As he saw the uncle and the nephew standing side by side, Wei Wuxian could indeed make out some similarities in their features. In fact, they looked like brothers. Zhang Chang gestured, and the paper man escaped from Wei Wuxian's grasp, flying into the sec chief's hand. He glanced at it, spite burst in his eyes, and he clenched the paper between his fingers. A spurt of flame engulfed it, and the spirit inside screamed as it was burned to ashes. Jiang Chang said darkly, <laughs> Break his legs? Haven't I told you that if you come across someone who practices these sinister things, you should just kill him and feed him to your dog? Wei Wuxian didn't even remember to hold on to the donkey's reins as he rapidly backed away. Originally, he had thought that, however much Jiang Chang had despised him so many years ago, by now the sect chief's hatred like fog or smoke should have been scattered by the winds of time. How could he have known forgiveness or even forgetfulness would hardly come at such a low price? Not only did Jiang Chang's hatred fail to dissipate, it had aged like wine, growing stronger and stronger as the years passed. He had started to take it out on any cultivator who imitated his despised former friend. With someone behind to protect and support him, Jin Ling swung his sword all the more viciously. Wei Wuxian's fingers probed the entrance of the spirit-locking pouch. But just as he was about to take action, a flash of blue sword light swept past him like lightning, clashing with Jin Ling's blade, shattering the weapon's golden rays in an instant. The outcome did not result from a difference in the quality of the swords, but rather the vast disparity in the wielder's strength. Wei Wuxian had originally timed his trick perfectly, but unexpectedly thrown off step by the tip of blade sailing past, stumbled and crashed into the ground right in front of a pair of snow-white boots. He froze for some time before slowly lifting his head. The first image that shined into his eye was the edge of a blade, glittering and translucent like ice. In the world of cultivation, this sword was very renowned. Wei Wuxian had learned of its might from countless fights, both shoulder to shoulder and face to face with its wielder. The hilt was forged out of silver with a secret technique known only to the smith. The blade was extremely thin and as clear as the purest crystal. Icy air emanated from it, like breath and iron parted before it, as though it were no more than clay. The entire sword was graceful, agile and awash in enchanted mist. But contrary to its light appearance, it was leaden with weight. An ordinary person was entirely unable to swing it. Bi Chen was its name. The tip of the blade swung around, and a shing <laughs> sounded above Wei Wuxian's head as it returned to its scabbard. 
Meanwhile, Jiang Chang's voice rang from far away. I was wondering who it was, Second Master Lan. The pair of white boots circled past Wei Wuxian, neither hasty nor slow, then walked forward three steps. Wei Wuxian raised himself up. As he brushed past young Master Lan, their gazes met briefly. Wei Wuxian pretended it was unintentional. The young man's whole body was draped in white silk that shined like moonlight. On his back he bore a seven-stringed guqin, which was uncommonly narrow and made of a soft raven feather black wood. A white cloth-patterned ribbon was tied around his forehead, and his skin was fair and unblemished. Like polished jade, he was both extremely beautiful and extremely refined. His eyes were very light, as if made of colored glaze, making his gaze appear cold and detached. His expression was tinged with frost and snow, and was solemn but not quite stiff. Though he saw Wei Wuxian's ridiculous appearance, not a single reaction rippled across his placid face. Not a single speck of dust soiled his appearance, nor was a single hair or thread out of place, nor did a single point in his countenance breach etiquette. Despite all of this, two words jumped into Wei Wuxian's head. Morning clothes. They really did look like morning clothes. No matter how many people extravagantly praised the beauty of the Lan Clan's uniforms, as though they were flowers floating on the breeze, and no matter Lan Wang Ji's reputation as a man of peerless, once-in-a-century beauty, his appearance still resembled that of a widower nursing a deep, bitter hate. The year was inauspicious, and enemies traveling along a narrow road were bound to meet. Blessings always came alone, but misfortunes never unaccompanied. Without uttering a word or glancing away, Lan Wang Ji stood face to face with Jiang Chang, motionless. Jiang Chang himself was an exceedingly handsome man, but compared to the one before him, his beauty was indeed somewhat inferior. Impatiently he raised an eyebrow and said, Hang Wang Jun, you're undoubtedly deserving of your fine reputation for appearing where the chaos is. So, how do you have the time to visit these old forests and mountains today? Elite cultivators like them normally disdain to take notice of low-level prey, but Lan Wang Ji was an exception. He was never selective about what he hunted, and would never refuse to go after a monster or demon just because it wasn't violent or fierce enough for killing it to improve his reputation. Ever since he was young, as long as someone requested help, he would come. Thus, appearing where the chaos is, was the phrase everyone used to describe Han Guangjun's night hunting habits and a form of praise for his character. Jiang Chang's tone was therefore remarkably rude. The flock of juniors who followed behind Lan Wangji, upon hearing the sect chief's words, grew quite uncomfortable. Lan Jing Yi, habitually blunt, said, But isn't Chief Jiang here too? Jiang Chang replied coldly, <laughs> When your seniors are talking, is it your place to interject? The Gusu Lan sect boasts of having the utmost concern for etiquette, yet it teaches its disciples like this. Appearing uninterested in arguing with him, Lan Wangji glanced at Lan Sijue, indicating that the juniors should settle this among themselves. Stepping forward, the boy said to Jin Ling, Young Master Jin, night hunts have always been fair competitions between sects and clans, but you've hung up these nets everywhere around Dafan Mountain. It makes it difficult for other cultivators to navigate the forest for fear they'll fall into a trap. Doesn't this violate the rules? Jin Ling's frosty expression was the exact same as his uncle's. They're the ones who stepped into the net, he said immediately. It's not my fault they were stupid. If you have a problem, wait until I finish catching my prey first. Then we can talk. La Wangji wrinkled his brow. Jin Ling was about to continue speaking, but suddenly found he could no longer open his mouth, nor could his throat produce any sound. Startled, he turned pale. Zhang Chang looked at his nephew, and saw that his lips were stuck together, inseparable by ordinary methods. His face began to grow red out of anger, and his words lost any veneer of politeness they had previously had. You with the surname Lan! What do you mean by this? Jin Ling isn't yours to discipline. Undo it! This silencing spell was used by the Lan clan to punish disciples for making mistakes. Wei Wuxian himself had fallen victim to the trick on several occasions. 
Though it wasn't a complicated high-level spell, no one but members of the Lan Clan could undo it. If someone forced their mouth open, either their lips would be shredded and start to bleed, or their throat would be mute for several days. Thus, the victim was forced to stay quiet, keep their mouth shut, and reflect on their shortcomings until the entire period of punishment passed. Lan Sidre said, Chief Jiang, there's no need to be angry. As long as he doesn't try to break the spell by force, it will undo itself in twenty to thirty minutes. Jiang Chang was just about to open his mouth when a man in a violet Jiang clan uniform bounded out of the forest, shouting. When he saw Lan Fangji, his face turned hesitant. Mockingly, Jiang Chang said, What's the bad news you're bringing to me this time? You may as well spit it out. The messenger said quietly, Not long ago, a blue sword flew around and ruined the spirit binding nets you set up, sir. Jiang Chang glowered at Lan Fangji, the fury in his heart rapidly leaking into his expression. How many? The messenger very carefully said, All of them. Over four hundred. Jiang Chang seethed. He very much hadn't expected this outing to be so wretched. Originally, he had come to help Jinling, who would turn fifteen this year and thus should be embarking on his career, competing with other juniors for experience and reputation. Jiang Chang had carefully sifted through the options before choosing Dafan Mountain as their hunting grounds, and then covered the area with nets to scare off cultivators from other clans. Because the nets would make navigation very difficult, they would have no option but to leave, thus eliminating the competition and leaving the prey to Jinling. Though 400 spirit binding nets cost an exorbitant price, it wasn't much the Yun Mong Jiang sect. The actual destruction of the nets was a small issue, the big issue was the loss of face. The fact that Lang Wangji had done such a thing made bitter resentment bleed from his heart and circulate up towards his head. The higher it got, the more resentful he became. He narrowed his eyes and, unconsciously or not, began stroking the ring around his right index finger with his left hand. This was a dangerous gesture. Everyone knew that ring was a fierce, deadly weapon. Once the chief of clan Jiang began to touch it, he intended to kill.